very happy to welcome for the first time Dr. Syed Ghathmadinejad. He rehearsed with me the pronunciation of his name, so my Farsi would be so good tonight. Um, as you know, he's a senior Iran and financial economics advisor at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, an organization which is an old friend of ours at Westminster. And he specializes in uh, Iran's economy and financial markets, sanctions, and illicit finance. He was born and raised in Iran, though he earned his PhD in finance from the City University of New York, where he specialized in the topic he will be addressing this evening, uh, including his uh, PhD dissertation on the subject of the effect of US sanctions in that country. He teaches finance at Baruch College of New York. He has a BS in, as a Renaissance man in engineering. Um, from the University of Tehran, and an MS in engineering from Ecole Spéciale des Travaux Publics in Paris. He's widely published, and I'm going to leave him with all the time now to speak on his subject, the effect of US sanctions on Iran's economy, lessons from the past and predictions for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for <coughs> inviting me here and for the opportunity. A special thanks to Bob for arranging it. And uh, special thanks to you uh, and my appreciation to you for coming here on, on this hot summer day. Uh, I apologize in advance for my time to time incomprehensible Iranian accent. I, it's probably too late for me to change it, so you're stuck with me. Uh, I would also like to let you know in advance that when it comes to the Islamist regime in Tehran, I'm quite biased. So I don't like the regime, does not uh, <clears throat> do a great job in describing my feelings about it. I really detest the regime. I think this uh, regime uh, has been a disaster for Iranian, has been a disaster for the people in the region. Uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of Syrian dead, Syrian children, women, men uh, would confirm it if they could. And I think this regime has harmed uh, the, the United States. It has killed hundreds of uh, American troops. And basically, I think it would have been, the world would be a better place if this regime does not exist. So that's my bias. Uh, I hope <laughs> I do. my my enemies <clears throat> accuse me of accuse me of being anti-regime. I totally accept that, so they are right about that. Uh, a few <clears throat> point about me, like again about my background. I was born and raised in Iran uh, after the '79 revolution, during the war. So early childhood memories of, are from the war and. Uh, Morality police, that's, uh, that's an experience that all Iranians have. And then I went to the University of Tehran. I was to be a civil engineer, but I liked politics a lot. So I became the political editor of an Iranian uh, student daily newspaper. And when I was 20 years old, uh, a few IRGC intelligence agents came into my car with guns and took me with my own car to the Evan Paris prison. So uh, I still find it very strange that they felt like I was some kind of leaders of protest or something like that, but that's apparently what they felt. And that also shaped my feelings and emotion about the IRGC. So I remember when the first time uh, Mark Dubowitz and I talked about working for, for FTD, he asked me, uh, he, he, uh, they, they saw a paper that I had written about the IRGC in the Tehran Stock Exchange. And he asked me, why did you choose this topic? And I said, because they arrested me. And that's really the reason why I have been so interested in what the IRGC has been doing since then. Tonight, I will be talking about the effect of US sanctions on Iran 
First, I just want to do a brief comparison of some uh, economic trends pre and post 79 revolution because that would be uh, very relevant to uh, the conclusions that I am going to make at the end. Next, there will be a few notes about Iran, Iran's economy, then an, an overview of US sanctions against Iran from 79 to 2013, and then I will dive into the Trump sanctions, how they are affecting Iran's economy, how they are affecting Iran's decision making, and after that I would like to say a few words about uh, what would be the U.S. optimum strategy about Iran, given what we know about the effect of the U.S. sanctions on Iran's economy. So here you have a, the GDP per capita, the real GDP per capita for Iran, Turkey, and South Korea. If you, if you start from 1960, goes to 2017. If you look at the beginning of it, you see that uh, Iran's GDP per capita was actually above Turkey and South Korea, the real one, and it's, it, it, it grows at, at a much faster rate than both of them, as you see there. It grows quickly up to 1977, and that's the year that you had some economic problem in Iran, the revolution starts, and in early 1979, the revolution, the Islamic revolution, succeeds. And then you see the trend totally reverses. Iran goes down, the GDP per capita goes down, and South Korea and Turkey, they are going up. And if you, if you, look, if you look at this, Iran's GDP per capita has never reached back to its high level uh, during the Shah. So that's really, that really summarizes the economic effect of the revolution on Iran. The next one is the GDP per capita at the current US. So the current dollar, the difference between the real and the current is that the real actually takes into account that one dollar in, for example, 1960 is not the same as one dollar in, in 2060. But even here you see the same trend, right? So in 1960, 1970, Iran's GDP per capita is still higher than Turkey and South Korea. It grows at a fast rate. It grows at a faster rate than Turkey's and South Korea's. And then after the revolution, it goes down. So the conclusion here is that not only Iran's GDP per capita, the real one, didn't go back to its pre-revolution level. What would have happened if there was not a, if there had not been a revolution? Uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Mohammad Jahan Parvar, who is a, uh, who's an economist at FED, he has a very good paper of this. I think the name is The Cost of the Revolution. But the answer is that Iran's economy should have been much better than South Korea and Turkey if the Shah's economic policy and the Shah's foreign policy had continued. Mm -hmm. And that's really, again, the cost of the revolution. So one may say that, and that after the 79 revolution, what happened was that Khomeini, who was the Shia cleric, who looked at the Shia as the chosen tribe of Allah, he actually told Iranians that you need to have more children. And that happened. The reason was that the Shia should have been much more numerous than the Sunnis, right? So that was in, the, in Khomeini's mind. And that happened. And one may say that, okay, so the population went up, so the GDP per capita uh, mechanically should go down. It's not the effect of the mismanagement. So if you look at the GDP, not just the GDP per capita, again, you see the same trend. You see the GDP is going up during the Shah uh, era, and then, then you have the uh, revolution. It goes down. So it's not really the effect of population in the GDP per capita. The economy has really gone bad under the, under the Islamic regime. And in the next slide, we have it in the, at the current level, the same trend. We talked about the economic effect of the revolution. On the social effect, 
I think as we can see in this picture, the effect was much harder on Iranian women. So on the top, on the left side, you see an, an Iranian actress before the revolution. On the right, you see Iranian, the same Iranian actress after the revolution. On the left, on the bottom, you see Iranian students before the revolution. On the right, you see Iranian students after the revolution. So the revolution really uh, hit, hit hard Iranian women more than, more than anyone else. So I want to conclude this first part. First, the Islamist regime in Tehran has destroyed Iran's economy. That, that's a fact. Second, if the Islamic revolution uh, had not happened and uh, the Shah's economic and foreign policy had continued, Iran's economy in terms of GDP and GDP per capita uh, would have been far above South Korea and Turkey. That's, that, that's something that we can uh, conclude. On the US side, US lost a key ally following the 1979 revolution. Shah was a pro-US uh, monarch. Iran was a, was a stabilizing force in the region and a key partner in fight against the communism. And Shah actually was fighting Islamism long before the US did. At the time, 1979, Islamism was not uh, much of a threat to the US. The US started fighting Islamism long after that. What replaced Shah, the Islamic uh, Republic, became U.S. main enemy in the region. It had, it had become the engine behind uh, the stabilization of the region and responsible for the deaths of hundreds of Americans in Lebanon, in Iraq, around the world. And what was the U.S. Uh, action to that? If uh, setting aside Carter, at least at the, during the revolution, after the hostage crisis, so all U.S. administrations have tried to somehow uh, <clears throat> uh, contain the net negative effect of Iranian regime's behavior. And one of the tools that they used was economic sanction. So we will be talking about uh, how this happened how they use the economic sanctions to contain Iranian behavior and whether it actually helped. Uh, before that, I have to say a few words about uh, Iran's economy. We will see after that how the sanctions evolved over time. So Iran's economy is significantly dependent on oil. So even after the economy has grown and it diversified, <coughs> oil is still between 2 to 20 to 25 percent of Iran's GDP. Here you see it from 2002 to 2012, but that doesn't summarize the real effect of oil, because if you look at the export, uh, at least 50 percent of Iran's export, sometimes more, sometimes a little less, comes from uh, exporting crude oil. So this is the hard currency which comes into Iran, which is really important. So. Uh, which is really the engine of the Iranian economy. And over the past few years, another 15% of Iran's exports come from uh, the petrochemical products. So this is, again, this is not crude oil, but it's very much dependent on, on oil. This is some kind of oil product. So why that's important? Because Iran's dependence on oil means that if you actually go and target the channel, you are actually putting a lot of pressure on the regime. This is not a well-diversified economy. So just by putting pressure on oil, you are going to cut at least 50% of Iran's uh, hard currency inflow. If you put pressure on the petrochemical, you are putting another 15%. So like 65% to 70% of Iran's hard currency is coming from these two industries. So that's, that means sanctions are actually can be very effective and they can quickly lead to uh, <clears throat> observable effect in Iran's economy, which should in turn 
be uh, observable in the way that Iran makes its uh, political and military decision. And that's actually something that, uh, that we see. Another uh, important point about Iran's economy is the role of the IRGC and the Supreme Leader. So this is something which is discussed in the financial and economic literature generally under the term of the political connection. So these are politically, enti politically connected entities in Iran's economy. And what makes it very interesting in Iran is that so these are bad actors. These are bad actors who are actually making decisions in Iran and they have a significant uh, economic influence there. They have significant uh, assets. They can be targeted. You can, uh, a few days ago, the United States targeted the Supreme Leader, right? That's at least two, $200 billion of assets under his direct control uh, in three uh, foundations. So when you have like these actors who have real economic interest, real financial interest, and you go after the, their assets, you can quickly, the, the pressure is directly imposed on them. It's not like you have like many private uh, sector companies and then you sanction those companies and those companies should go to policymakers and tell them that these sanctions are hurting us. You are sanctioning the IRGC, you are sanctioning the Supreme Leader Business Empire, it's directly imposed on them. They quickly feel the pressure. So a few notes about the IRGC uh, uh, Business Empire. So the IRGC uh, <clears throat> is Iran's main military force and the key player in the country's economic and policy. It was established after the 1979 revolution by Khomeini's followers. Uh, its main goal at that time was to be a counterweight against the army, which was the royal army, and the mullahs really feared that there, there would be a coup. So they created the IRGC to watch the army, and to be a counterweight. But then you had the war. During the war, the IRGC became actually more like a conventional army. So before it was more like an intelligence uh, service. During the war, it added the conventional army uh, to its characteristic. Another point to <clears throat> make about the IRGC is that so the IRGC entered Iran's economy after the war. The reason was that during the war, so most of the Iranian resources have been uh, uh, was going to, to, to the war effort, and IRGC was getting a lion's share of it. So IRGC amassed lots of. Uh, equipments and assets and things like that, and you couldn't take it back from them, like it was not easy to do that. So, and when the war was over and Khomeini died and Rafsanjani came, so the reconstruction era started, and Rafsanjani told the government estate entities that go and raise your own money. Like, we don't have much money, you can go and raise your own money. And these uh, lots of contracts went to the IRGC. And it's not very related, but it's important to know that when Rafsanjani came into the power, Rafsanjani actually was much closer to the IRGC than Khamenei. Khamenei was not that close to the IRGC. The IRGC people actually didn't like Khamenei at all. Khamenei didn't have much power in the 80s, and he was much closer to the army. And Rafsanjani was very close to the IRGC. So Rafsanjani, I think, thought that I'm going to give all these contracts to my IRGC pals, and I will be using them to control the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei. That actually didn't happen. Khamenei outsmarted him. And <clears throat> but, in, but anyway, so the IRGC entered the Iran's economy, 
IRGC penetrated Iran's economy gradually. The historic point was 2004. So before that, the IRGC start, uh, intervenes in Iran's economy through three channels. One is the IRGC Cooperative Foundation, Passage Cooperative Foundation, and Khatam al Garrison, the Khatam al headquarters. All three of them, I'm not sure if the Treasury has designated Basij Cooperative Foundation, but the IRGC Co-op and Khatam al headquarters, they are, they are sanctioned. They have a vast network of uh, subsidiaries. Uh, currently, I think the last number that uh, I have uh, I have identified, I think, I haven't identified until now, like 800 subsidiaries, companies, and close to 2,000 managers. So we have, we are following, we are tracking these companies and managers. These are like, uh, the number is huge, 800, it's 800, 900. I don't think it's even 10% of it. But, <clears throat> so, as we said in the 90s, they started to penetrate Iran's economy. A main point, a historic point, was 2004, when the guard seized Tehran's uh, new airport to protest the involvement of a Turkish company in the managing of the airport. So IRGC controls all the ports and airports. That's important to them for their terrorism supporting activities, for smuggling. IRGC is the main smuggler in the country. IRGC is heavily involved in drug trafficking, so they really control the border. So this uh, Turkish company was supposed to manage the new airport, and IRGC was not happy about it. So what they said, they said that this Turkish company is connected to a Zionist company. And they, were, they went and actually took over the airport. They said, as long as the Turkish company is here, no airplane is coming here. And what happened was that the Turkish company had to, had to leave. So IRGC, in fact, uh, showed everyone that it has the right of first refusal for large projects in Europe. So that was a, that was a turning point. Another one was May 2005. So Iran's economy after the revolution, uh, state took over everything. So they kicked they kicked out entrepreneur, took their assets, and everything was state-owned. So in 2005, the Supreme Leader issued a decree demanding a vast privatization program over a five-year period. So what happened actually was that lots of these state-owned uh, assets went to Khamenei's business empire and the IRGC-owned companies. So you had a transfer of assets which were owned, which were controlled by the executive branch to uh, entities controlled by Khamenei and by, by the IRGC. I think the, the reason that Khamenei decided that was that in 1997, uh, Khatami came into power. He quickly turned out not to be a reformist, was a fake reformist. But still, to Khamenei, who wants to control everything, he suddenly figured it out that so these, all these assets which are under control of the executive branch, when there are like uh, when there is a president who may not be who may have a little independence, it becomes difficult for the for the, for Khamenei's cronies to have the largest share because the president has has his own. Cronies, right? So he's giving money and assets to his friends. So the solution was that, okay, we are going to have a fake privatization, take the asset from the executive branch, give it to the IRGC and my own <coughs> business empire. So that's what happened in 2005. Another important point for the IRGC was 2009. You had this green revolution in Iran and uh, the normal or what hardliner or conservative or whatever they call them. So these political uh, forces in Iran, supporter of uh, the Supreme Leader, they really failed to uh, neutralize the Green Revolution. What actually helped was the IRGC. So the IRGC came in, 
uh, they crushed the protest and now they needed uh, reward, right? So you had the vast transfer of assets to the IRGC after 2009. In one case, for example, the telecommunication company of Iran at the time was $8 billion. And it's not a lot in context of the US, but in context of the Iranian economy, that was a very big uh, company. So that was transferred to the IRGC and lots of other assets. So the IRGC controls like um, between 15 to 20 percent, 25 percent, the number goes up and down. Uh, it received billions of dollars in contracts, especially when Ahmadinejad was in power, has a considerable share of Iran's underground economy, which is that Iran's underground economy itself is like estimated to be 25 to 35 percent of Iran's GDP. And the IRGC has a tight control over that. And they are really involved in everything. Then we have the Khamenei controlled companies. So the Khamenei has a vast business empire too. Uh, it's usually uh, controlled three, through three foundations. The ICO, which is the execution of Imam, or, Imam Khomeini order, the Mossad Afan Foundation, which is foundation of the oppressed, and the Aslan Quds, which is the eighth Imam shrine in the east of Iran. So these three companies, uh, they have acquired a vast, a, a good portion of their assets through confiscation of dissidents' assets. So at the beginning of the revolution, they got other, they, they got um, uh, the Shah people's assets, and then, as uh, you know, they kicked out more people out of the country. They took their assets. Until now, if you, if the government goes after your assets, and if somehow they cannot find who should be the just owner, it goes to the supreme leader. So in many cases, they cannot actually find who is the real owner. So those assets are going to the supreme leader. But that's not that. We can call that the seed money that Khamenei received from Iranians. So after that, uh, you, they are getting old contracts. So for example, after the JCPOA, the first oil contract, the first big oil contract went to the supreme leader's uh, business empire. That has actually a very funny story because the company which got that was a company that Khamenei <coughs> created. The name is Barkett Foundation. It was supposed to be a micro finance company giving small loans to people in the rural part of Iran or small cities so they can you know, create their own small businesses. But suddenly it became a vast pharmaceutical uh, holding and then it went into the oil. So you can see like all these uh, foundations which are, uh, which are presented as charity, these are really big uh, uh, business, business empire owned, uh, owned by Khamenei. So we, I, I actually did a valuation of the Khamenei's uh, assets, and in the most conservative uh, estimate, it has $200 billion of assets. That's the most conservative. I think the actual number should be much higher, at least like around $300 billion, $350 billion. Uh, and I tell you why. For example, the Mossad Afan Foundation, which is one of these foundations, says that in one year, it uh, only it's good manufacturing holding. They uh, export at 700 million euro. And they say this is 10% of our total revenue in that year. So they had a total revenue of 7 billion uh, euro. So if you say, okay, you have an asset turnover of just 10%, that means only the manufacturing part of the company the Mossad Afan Foundation should have 70 billion euro dollar in asset, your euro in asset. So that's that's just one part of it. You don't consider the real estate holding, you don't consider the service uh, holding of them, and that's just one of the foundations. 
So the ICO asset has been estimated to be $95 billion. So the, the real number, the point is that it's really above this $200 billion. So they don't pay tax. They can't be audited unless the Supreme Leader himself uh, uh, allows it, gives the permission. So they don't pay tax. They cannot be audited. They basically do whatever they want. In 2013, ICO and 37, uh, 37 of its, its subsidiaries have been uh, designated by Obama administration. But what happened was that, and it was not related to nuclear issue. It was related to support for terrorism, I think, and corruption. In 2015, uh, as part of the JCPOA to make the deal sweet to the Supreme Leader, the whole uh, business empire of the Supreme Leader has been uh, <clears throat> delisted. So they were not uh, sanctioned after that. And we actually tracked it, I tracked it, and they received lots of uh, deal after the 2015, uh, when the foreign companies started to going into Iran. Lots of uh, European companies and Chinese companies, South Korean companies, they signed uh, big deals with uh, these foundations controlled by the Supreme Leader. So the next, uh, <clears throat> the next part that I want to talk about is a brief history of sanctions against Iran uh, since uh, 19, between 1979 and 2013. Uh, <clears throat> what we, <clears throat> after the 1979, the first sanctions that happened uh, was related to the, to the hostage crisis. So as a result of the hostage crisis, you had some sanctions. They reached a deal, but in the 80s, Iranian started to, the Iranian regime started to kill Americans. So you had, uh, in the uh, 80s, you had new sanctions. Uh, for example, in 1987, you had the import of all goods, including oil, from Iran became forbidden. In 1995, the Clinton administration banned U.S. investment in Iran. One year later, <clears throat> the U.S. banned any investment more than 20 million in Iran's oil sector. And in early 2000, the United States introduced a few authorities to sanction Iran for supporting terrorism and WMD. In, but those were not really very significant sanctions. So the U.S. said we are not going to trade with you in the 80s, uh, Iran was not a good place to trade. In the 90s, Europeans and Eastern Asian companies started to trade with Iran. In 2003, IAEA confirmed that the presence of undeclared uh, nuclear sites in Iran, which led to a negotiation between Iran and uh, European powers. And they, mad they, had a, they reached an agreement in 2005 Iran decided that they don't want to be in the agreement anymore. So they reactivated their nuclear program. So that was the, the 2005 breach of the agreement was the time that uh, the international community started to really go after Iran's economy with the sanctions. And as, as we will see, the sanctions really evolved over time. So they, uh, the international community started to use the sanction. Obviously, at the beginning, they were not very good. Iranians uh, were quick to find the way to bypass these sanctions, and the sanctions in themselves were not very strong. So you have UN sanctions. You have UN sanctions, EU sanctions, and US sanctions. And then there are other countries like Canada, UK, Japan, they introduced their own sanctions, but the main sanctions are US and EU. And the UN sanctions usually provide the, uh, <clears throat> the legal authority for other countries to do more. The UN sanctions in terms of economic effects have never been very strong. It's the, it's the US and EU sanctions 
which have been very strong. So here you have like the list of EU sanctions, and here you have a list of US sanctions between 2006 and 2013. The sanctions until like 2010 really didn't have the teeth to bite Iran. It was in 2010 that uh, uh, EU and US went after Iran's oil. As, as I said at the beginning, Iran's is, Iran is very dependent on oil, so if you want to put pressure on them, you should go after the oil. So talking about like we are not allowing you to import, I don't know, the nuclear facility, that doesn't help that much. You need to go after the oil. So in 2010, uh, EU and US targeted Iran's oil. The United States sanctioned the sale of gasoline to, uh, to Iran or supporting its domestic production. The EU uh, banned uh, the sale of technology to Iran. In 2011, the United States expanded its sanction on Iran's energy and financial sector. So. Financial sector sanctions are important because so Iran sells its oil, let's say China buy it from Iran. But if you go after the financial sector, then they cannot repatriate the revenue. It becomes very difficult for Iran. And this is what actually happened. Yes, on the paper, let's say China buy oil from Iran. So on the paper, it has all the reason to pay them, right? But if you have the sanction on the financial sector, the Chinese are very smart. They want to get a better deal than uh, from Iran. So they go and tell to Iranian that uh, we cannot actually pay you back. We are doing you a favor buying your oil, but we cannot give you your money because our banks are being sanctioned. So let's have your money blocked here. And what happens that what happened was that so Iran was forced to buy lots of uh, Chinese goods at a very high price. So even if you see that, for example, in the news, uh, you may see that China will be buying some oil from Iran. It doesn't mean that Iran gets the money. And that's really uh, <clears throat> what's very important. If, if we can actually uh, put pressure on China, make, make, make sure that it doesn't buy oil, that's, that's very good. But even if they buy some level of oil, it doesn't mean that Iran is going to get the money. So in 2011, as I said, so the oil sanction <coughs> uh, and financial sanction, you had new development there, uh, more uh, significant sanctions happened there. You had the SWIFT sanction in the same year and <coughs> In 2013, you had some sanctions on, uh, again, on Iran, Iran's energy sector, on the automotive industry, and on real. So that was the sanctions up to 2013. The real sanctions started in 2010. And that's something that we, we will be discussing when we, when we talk about the current sanction. Because Obama sanction, it really took like three years to affect Iran's economy. Trump sanction has done it at a, a much more effective way in one year. And that's very interesting because the consensus among the DC experts, the DC foreign policy establishment has always been that if you don't go multilateral, if you go unilateral, the sanctions are not effective. We actually saw that the sanctions have been more effective when the United States went unilateral. And there is a reason for that, because if you go multilateral, you have to convince everyone. And then everyone comes back to you and say, okay, this is really too tough, so uh, our businesses are not happy with this, so let's, become, let's, let's make it a little softer. If you go unilateral, you don't have to do that. Right, and U.S. economy is quite uh, powerful, and even if the European countries, the governments, they say they don't want to comply with the sanctions, the European companies will comply with the sanctions, and that's what we <coughs> actually have seen. How much time do I have? Okay. okay. 
So <clears throat> the point about the uh, sanctions up to 2013 is that the, the lesson is that the oil and financial sanctions were the most effective one. They really affected Iran's economy. Uh, here is Iran's oil export between 2011 and 2014. And as you see, the, at some point between 2012 and 2013, Iran's average oil export went to 1.1 1 million barrels per day. Right now, Iran's uh, export is estimated following the May 2019 to be between 200,000 barrels per day or 400,000 barrels per day, much below the highest achievement of the previous round of sanctions. That, that's, that's quite important. <clears throat> so this is the GDP growth for Iran. This, this is from the World Bank. And as you see, Iran's GDP growth started to going down from 2010 went down to uh, entered the negative area in 2013 and then only in 2014 went back after they had the JPOA, the Joint Plan of Action. So here you have the inflation. So as you see the inflation here goes from uh, close to 10% in 2010 up to 40 percent in 2013. So again, it took the Obama sanctions, the real sanctions, three years to uh, put Iran in a place where when its GDP growth became negative and the inflation went really high, up to 40 percent. So that was the point in 2013. That was the point that Iran decided that we have to we have to come and negotiate. Right, the, the economy was really under pressure. Their access to hard currency was very much limited. Their asset reserve was going down. The inflation was high. The unemployment was high. And uh, the Supreme Leader decided that we have, we have to come to the negotiation, negotiation table. And they found, a, they found a partner who was willing to uh give them what they want right iran made some concessions but the concessions which were made was not uh proportionate to the leverage that us had so us was very close to actually force them to collapse economically right so very high inflation uh, negative growth limited access to hard currency but that leverage uh, my belief is that has not been used well, so the concessions that Iran made was, was not enough. So a few points about the uh, sanctions up to 2013. As I said, the sanctions were successful. The sanctions against politically connected entities were successful. So I, ha I uh, studied the effect of sanctions on the IRGC firms and Supreme Leaders firms. Those sanctions were quite successful. If you look at the, the, the numbers, those which are in the financial market, so we have the, we have the numbers, the sanctions show a very real effect uh, on, on these politically connected firms. The politically connected firms are doing much worse than the non-politically connected firms. And the sanctions forced Tehran to negotiate. So the, the key question, the Obama administration said that we had to negotiate with Iran at that point because the sanctions were falling apart. If we were not going to the negotiation table, the sanctions were falling apart. Is that true? We know, from, we know now that this, this is not true. The U.S. economy could put pressure on Iran, even if the Europeans and the Chinese and the Russians, they were saying that, okay, we want to deal with Iran. The pressure could be continued. Then the nuclear deal happened in 2013. You had the JPOA, which was some kind of temporary deal between Iran and the P5 plus one. Uh, Iran was allowed to sell some oil. I think the petrochemical sanctions were removed uh, until they reach uh, a permanent deal, right? And then in 2015, they reached a permanent deal, which was called JCPOA. 
right? And JCPOA was reached in July 2015. In October 2018, which was adoption day, uh, Iran started impl implementing some measures. The US and EU, the P5 plus one, started to get prepared to lift the sanctions. Then you had the implementation day in January 2016, which is the real day that the sanctions have been lifted. And then you have the transition day. This is something that you have been hearing a lot. Like in, in transition day, lots of these sanctions are going to be removed. At the time it was, <clears throat> it looked too far, 2023, October 2023, that the IAEA should say that Iran's uh, nuclear program is peaceful. And then P5 plus one, remove all of the other sanctions. Right now it seems very close, right? Like so the critics of the nuclear deal were saying that these uh, sunset clauses, these are not helpful. Many of these restrictions on Iranian nuclear programs should be permanent. So, and I think they, they, they were right because right now what we saw after the deal was that Iran's economy has improved. Here you have the inflation. The inflation quickly went down, right? From 40% in 2013 to <clears throat> a little above 15% in 2014. In 2015 went to uh, 13%, then after that went below 10%. So from the inflation point, that really helped Iran the GDP growth Iran had a two-digit GDP growth in 2016, 13%. After that, in 2017, that's the year that uh, Trump came in, right? So that's the Trump effect. It goes down, but it is still close to 4%, right? So if, the, if, if Trump was not president or if Trump was not going to end the deal, so Iran's economy was going to do very well. So we followed the number of companies which entered Iran, foreign companies. So we uh, tracked 300 foreign companies which decided to have a deal with Iran. These are like uh, at least tens of billions of dollars of deal, probably hundreds of uh, billions of dollars. So lots of money coming into Iran. Iran's GDP is growing, Iran's inflation is going down. So what's happening in the political side in the region? So Iran, after the deal, Iran took control of four Arab capitals in the region. In Yemen, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq. So these are the countries which have been under Iran's control. Iran was able to actually inject lots of money into its proxies. So the Israeli military intelligence estimates that Iran's uh, <clears throat> support for Hezbollah after the deal actually quadrupled from like mm -hmm. around $200 million to $800 million. So that, that's, that's, that effect you saw in Iran's uh, growing influence in the region, right? So, so everything was going well for the Islamic Republic until Trump came in. So, so Trump came into power with the promise that he would get out of the deal. Uh, it, at the beginning, it was not very clear if whether he was doing it or not doing it. In October 2017, it became clear that he is really serious about that, right? And in January 2018, he, he gave an ultimatum to the EU and to the P4 plus one and Iran that you need to fix the flaws of the deal or I'm going to get out of the deal. Uh, People didn't take it that seriously still. And then in May 2018, he said, we are going to leave the deal, right? And after that, in August 2018, <clears throat> the sanctions which uh, Obama has lifted, the first round of them uh, were reimposed. And then in November 2018, the second round. So the, the November one was the oil sanction. The most important one was the oil sanction. And I think the petrochemical was also very important. <clears throat> in November 2018, so under Obama, uh, the United States gave waiver to countries to buy Iranian oil at a limited level. So in November 2018, Trump gave the same waiver uh, for eight countries. 
the number has not been revealed, but based on the reports that we have, I think it was uh, 800,000 ba 800, barrels per day to 1 million barrels per day, something between that, for those eight countries. And in May 2019, the waiver ended. So uh, the United States said, you are not going to buy Iranian oil. And what happened since then is that Iran, Iran's exports of oil quickly went down. So as I said, it's estimated somewhere between 200,000 barrels per day and 400,000 barrels per day. So <clears throat> again, this shows that the unilateral sanctions are quite effective. So what happened after Trump came in in Iran's economy? So Iran's currency has significantly lost its value. In January 20, uh, 2017, when Trump came to power, one dollar was worth 39,350 real, real is Iran's currency. Right now, one dollar is 129,500 real, and at some point went even much higher. So Iran managed to curb it a little. What they did was that, so basically they went after people who were buying dollar. So they put them in prison. Those who were selling dollar, they didn't approve. They put them in prison. I think they actually executed <clears throat> someone related to this. They told the families that you cannot hold uh, dollar. I don't know about which number, but they set a limit that you can only have this amount of dollar. If we catch you and you are having more than that, you are going to prison and we get your money. They also <clears throat> uh, set a limit on the uh, amount of dollar that Iranians who are uh, uh, traveling abroad, they can buy. So they uh, uh, suppressed the demand and they controlled the supply. So, but still this is very high. So this is like uh, almost three times, right? And then following the nuclear deal, nuclear deal in May 2018, 300 companies uh, went into Iran signing deals. Right now we track that only 15% of them saying that they will be staying in Iran. And these are not, uh, many of them are in the sectors which are not sanctioned, right? So this is not that, uh, not all of them are saying that we are not complying with the US sanctions. And if you look at them, even this 15%, not all of them are going, I think majority of them are not going to honor the deals that they had. The only thing that they are doing is that they want to stay in Iran to make sure that when the sanctions are lifted, they will be the first companies which are getting those deals. So it's not that uh, these 15% of companies are actually doing anything in Iran. So Iran, from the FDI point of view, <coughs> from trade point of view, has lost a lot the Islamic Republic. Uh, the economy is facing very high inflation. So this is the this is the number up to March 2019. As you see in the gray one, which is a 12 months average, it's it's uh, above 30 percent, and the 12 months point to point is above 50 percent. What it tells you is that uh, in less than a year, uh, the Trump sanctions have managed to put Iran from the inflation point of view very much close to the height of the sanctions in 2013. <coughs> Again, this shows the power of the unilateral sanctions of the United States. And from the <coughs> GDP growth point of view, so as, as we said, Iran actually had a two-digit GDP growth in 2016. And in 2017, uh, Trump was in power, but he has not left, left, uh, left the deal yet. It had a decent 4% growth. <clears throat> in 2018, it went into the negative area. So Iran's economy is in recession now. 
and in 2019, in the conservative estimate, it's a 6% negative. So Iran's economy will shrink by 6%. So that's, <clears throat> that's another important point. GDP growth is, is going down. Iran's economy is shrinking. From the oil export point of view, Iran was uh, exporting 2.5 million barrels per day in April, April 2018. It's now between 200,000 barrels to 400,000 barrels. And the sanctions on Iran's petrochemical here. So, in November 2018, mm -hmm. we had the uh, sanctions on Iran's petrochemical introduced. So if you look at the numbers for October, it's some, somehow close to $1.6 billion of petrochemical products. In March 2019, it's almost halved. It's 50% 50, 50 of it. <clears throat> one point about the petrochemical one is that if you look at which, com which countries are buying Iran's petrochemical, uh, except China, which is always there as a biggest buyer. The other ones are US allies, right? UAE, Turkey. Turkey actually uh, increased uh, its average monthly import of petrochemical from Iran 12 times. So which is, based, which is obviously it's not for Turkey itself. So what they are doing is that so they get these petrochemical products, they repackage it, re-export it to <coughs> other countries. But still, this is a 50% decrease in uh, petrochemical export. U.S. managed for the first time to go after the metal industry. This is a $5 billion of Iranian export. So <coughs> we, haven't, we don't have the number yet. It was, the sanctions was recently introduced, but we expect to see the same trend here. We expect the same, uh, mm -hmm. Iran's uh, export revenue in the metal industry to go, to go down. We see the same thing in the uh, automotive industry, which is the uh, lar largest industry after the uh, oil and petrochemical, and in terms of employment, it's actually the largest one. So <coughs> close to one million uh, in the, in the, in the, in the um, manufacturing I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, close to one million people are employed there, so we see we see a recession in that sector too. So the point is that the U.S. sanctions, the U.S. unilateral sanctions, are very effective. Trump sanctions are much more effective than the previous round of sanctions that we had. The U.S. has very strong leverage here. <clears throat> the point is what U.S. is going to do with that. Is it going to nego negotiate another deal with Iran uh, soon or not? From <clears throat> my point of view, the best thing to do is just to wait. Just wait and let the economic sanctions to do their job. The, <clears throat> the, kind of, uh, the Islamic Republic's economy will collapse under the sanctions. The key is who is going to win the 2020 election. So before the 2020 election, it's very, I really doubt that Iran is going to reach any <clears throat> deal with uh, the United States. They will wait to see who is going to win. If you, <clears throat> when you look at the uh, debates in the Dem Democratic Party, all of them want to go back to the JCPOA, which is something that Iran really like. So it doesn't make sense for Iran to reach any deal before, the 2000, before 2020. So after 2020, if <clears throat> Trump wins, he has four more years. So this is six years of very serious economic sanctions on Iran. There is no way that the economy can manage to survive that. So at some point, they should come back to the table. And at that point, the US can get a much better deal than Iran. But the point with any deal with Iran about its nuclear program is that <clears throat> if you get the best deal from them, this is a regime which wants nuclear bomb. And one way or another, they are going, if they are in power, they are going to build the bomb at some point. Because building a nuclear bomb, it's not a very you know, technically difficult uh, thing. 
and U.S. right now has the leverage to actually to actually force the regime to collapse. So what the <clears throat> what the United States can do is to at least wait two years into the second Trump administration if he wins. <clears throat> Uh, wait for the collapse of the regime, support the pro-democracy movement in Iran. So if they can actually take care of the regime themselves, that would be very good for, for everyone. If they can't, <coughs> then after two years, <coughs> in like 2022, uh, <coughs> something like that, right? So you can go back to the negotiation, negotiation table with Iran and reach a deal with them. I don't think that deal is going to last. The, the moment that Iran is coming, the pressure is gone, they have access to energy and financial markets again. They are going back to their, <coughs> to their previous behavior. But I think it, at least the United States sh should try to force them to, the, to collapse because it's very unlikely that you are going to get another chance like this anytime soon. And there are things that the United States can do <coughs> to help this regime to collapse. So for example, the State Department can actually support the more political group, uh, the Iranian uh, political groups, which want to overthrow this regime. This is something that the State Department has not done. Uh, they are very much involved in uh, civil society building and things like that, like you know, supporting environmentalists, supporting uh, things like that, which which are good, supporting women's rights movement, which are which are good, but this is not going to resolve to solve the problem that the United States has, has, has with the Islamic Republic. Other things that can be done, for example, <clears throat> U.S. has. Voice of America and Radio Farda, which are broadcasting uh, into Iran, they can be improved. There are lots of uh, troubles with them. Uh, many people are accusing them of uh, even supporting the regime time to time. So that can, their, their messaging can change. And if you look at, for example, Al Jazeera, the role that it played in the, <clears throat> in the uprising against the Sunni countries uh, in the Arab world, Al Jazeera was actually encouraging those protests. So if you really want to encourage Iranian people to go to the street, you may, you may need something like Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera is an evil network, but you can use the method to do something good. Then you can, the US intelligence agencies can actually, they have access to information which can discredit Iranian officials, their corruptions, the, if, if, if that pops up in, in the news, in the media, that would be very helpful. They can actually initiate a campaign of defection, help Iranian officials to leave the regime, join, join forces with the opposition. That's something that the intelligence agencies can do. Uh, other, people's can, can, uh, other agencies cannot do. Another thing, for example, the FBI and the Justice Department can do is to really go after the <coughs> regime's money laundering net network. All these money laundering operation at some point touches the US financial system. So if you go after them aggressively, you really disrupt them. Also, <coughs> the, they can go after the regime's uh, influence network uh, here in the United States. This is something which has not been done. Uh, other thing which can be done, uh, Department of Defense can go after the Iranian, the Islamic regime's proxies in the region. U.S. had a very good chance to hit Hezbollah in Syria. U.S. has a very good chance to hit the Houthis in Yemen. This has not been done. Putting pressure on the regime's proxies will help. And <clears throat> also taking uh, seriously the security of the international waterways. We have seen that the Iranians, uh, the Iranian regime, uh, they have attacked tankers <coughs> in uh, Persian Gulf uh, and through Houthis <coughs> in other places. So strong response can be can be actually 
very, very, very helpful. And I think through these measures, the United States can actually force the regime to collapse. I think the best thing which can happen to everyone is if this regime uh, collapses under the pressure of economic sanctions. Again, I don't think, <clears throat> I think any deal that the, that the United States reaches with Iran, with the Islamic regime, the moment that they get the money back, they go back to their bad behavior. That's, <clears throat> that's really the message I want to send tonight, that I think uh, <clears throat> the best thing we all can do is to ask <clears throat> the people we know in the government, in the think tanks, in the media, that this is really the best way to, to go. Help the regime, help the Iranian people to, to overthrow the regime themselves. No one needs a military intervention, no one needs US troops on the, on the ground. This regime can collapse under the pressure of economic sanctions. Thank you so much. I want to pursue the issue of the regime collapse. One of the issues which we look at is you take out a regime, who's left? Mm -hmm. Is there a political leader is it working that is not working but available that can step in, become an actual leader, and does that person have a structure and a motivation behind him to govern a country? So <clears throat> I'm Iranian, so I may be biased here, but if you look at the pictures that I show you, the graphs that I show you. Uh, what you see there is that the uh, pre-revolution Iran was actually a, had a very good performance. Mm -hmm. And that's reflected in the past two years' uh, events that you see in Iran. So many Iranians are chanting Pahlavi's name. Uh, Shah's son lives here in, the, in D.C. Uh, his name, his father's name, his grandfather's name has been uh, chanted a lot in Iran. Uh, <clears throat> so that, that's, uh, that's a leader. He's, a, he's, a, he's not Islamist, obviously, right? He's very much liberal, westernized, and uh, he's, he defends a secular democracy. He doesn't even defend monarchy. So that's one of the leaders. There, there, are, there, are, other, there are other groups. Uh, too. You have like the leaders of Iranian civil society who can uh, <clears throat> who can organize uh, the society for a post-revolution Iran. From the U.S. point of view, mm -hmm. that I can tell you that there are some concerns that if the Iranian if the Islamic regime collapses, who comes? Things will go mad. This is the state sponsor, this is the most dangerous state sponsor of terror. Like this is the regime which is supporting every terrorist around the world. They are in Latin America, they are in Africa. Like for why they are in Latin America? Like this is a very aggressive regime. And if this regime falls, even if you don't have a Western liberal democracy in Iran, even if there is some <clears throat> period of mm, trouble in Iran, from that would be bad for Iranians who are living there, living under chaos, that would be bad, right? Even for six months, even for one year. But from the United States point of view, this, if this regime falls, that's a big gain for the United States because you have the command and control of the global terrorism falling apart. So the Hezbollah is not going to get its money. The Houthis are not going to get their money. The, <clears throat> the terrorist groups, uh, the, uh, the AQ, which has a relation with Iran, they are not going to get the support they have. Now, Assad regime is not going to get the support they need. It, it needs. Hamas is not going to get it, the support it needs. And we know from the recent reports that this is not just in Middle East. They are in the U.S. Hezbollah is in the U.S. Hezbollah has been preparing for attacks in the U.S. So I think that would be that would be a good thing for the United States. Just the collapse of this regime. Mr. 
Oh, he actually, the Supreme Leader actually really mocked him. So, you know, the day that he was there, they, they attacked the tanker. Uh, the Supreme Leader told him that he's not going to negotiate with, uh, with Trump. So I don't think it had any significance, except that it showed that this regime really is not in a negotiation mode at this point. <coughs> Thank you very much for that excellent talk. If I may uh, ask you this question. I was uh, worried about the reform of the Chinese military because corruption was endemic in the Chinese military. If you wanted to be, you could buy a generalship in the, in the army. So the, the question relates to the IRGC, which controls such an enormous part of the economy. How are are they corrupt? I mean, are they? Yeah, they are. They are very corrupt. They actually arrested their own financial mastermind recently <clears throat> over the corruption charges, and obviously, it was not just corruption. The real reason I think they had uh, internal fighting inside the IRGC. But the charges that they brought in was, was real. Like, the guy was quite corrupt. So, <clears throat> and they are talking about even uh, executing him uh, at some point in the future. So, yeah, they are, they are, they are very corrupt, yeah. But, but in this respect, in the, in the Chinese military, the corruption, they, they, they were inept. The, the corrupt generals had militarily no idea what they were doing. Does mm -hmm. the corruption in the IRGC reflect also military ineptness or not, what would you know? So IRGC is very good in <clears throat> asymmetrical warfare, like, you know, finding, funding terrorist groups. They have done a much better job in Iraq, for example. United States spent so much money in Iraq, but it's gotten for the money who is ruling Iraq. So <clears throat> they, they are good in uh, some areas and they are very bad in uh, other areas. Like, you know, like in war games, people die in, in the IRGC war games all the time. So, you know. One, one I think they question. bomb each other or they kill each other or something like that. <clears throat> and they say they, they are martyrs, so. Thank you for very interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, you ran down a list of because you you have to put it on. Yeah. You ran down a list of about a half a dozen things that we could be doing that we aren't doing. Just curious, why do you think we aren't doing them? If it is, if we are taking such a unilaterally effective approach and a strong approach to that could eventually lead to. Sooner rather than later, in terms of perhaps, why aren't we doing all those other things in the interest of time that um, the current administration will be around? Well, nothing is guaranteed, but most mm -hmm. likely the re election is mm -hmm. likely, but it's not guaranteed. Why aren't we doing any of those things? Or all of them? Uh, the quick answer is that I don't know, but uh, uh, if, the official policy of the U.S. administration is not that we want the that we want the Islamic regime to collapse. The official policy is that we want to put pressure on them so they come back to the negotiation table. So some of the things that they described uh, is very much aimed at forcing the regime to collapse. One, one last question. Hmm? Right. Oh, I'm wondering. Uh, what the reaction of the Iranian public would be to uh, a U.S. military action against Iran? Would it trigger a strong nationalistic uh, response in Germany? Uh, what kind of military action, like? Well, some, some strike uh, against uh, Iranian territory. So first I, first, I really don't know. Like, mm -hmm. Iran, Iran has a divided population, like you have a uh, minority of Islamists which are supporting the regime, and then you have a majority of Iranians who don't like this 
who don't like this regime. <coughs> uh, so I don't know what would be the reaction of Iranians. I think it depends on where the United States is going to strike. If the United States strikes the Supreme Leader's house, I think many people will be happy. So, uh, <coughs> But I, I assume that it, it should uh, create a wave of nationalism among some, sec some sections of Iranians' population. How, how big it would be, uh, I, I don't know. And there are, there are sections of Iranian population, like I, I was in Iran, so I left Iran like 10 years ago. At that time, if you sat in a taxi, there, there was always one person who was saying that when the U.S. is going to attack Iran, so uh, get rid of this mullah. So you have that, that, sec that section too, but, Iran, but you don't have any opinion poll in Iran, so it's very difficult to say what would be the reaction. Thank you very much.